good afternoon to my esteemed colleagues, Professor Keshav Kumar and Professor Ravi Singh, uh, Professor Anakshi, and uh, other esteemed colleagues here, uh, and my very dear students. Uh, so, uh, as Professor Keshav has rightly pointed out, you know, we need to keep ourselves updated in philosophy. Uh, the problem, one of the problem in philosophy is that, philosophy in India, I would say, that it is not much updated. And whenever there is a bit of an updating, it goes to such a narrow area that we get to know more and more about less and less. And that creates a large area of epistemic ignorance with a little lighted area of epistemic gnosis. You know, if you remember Professor Jane Mohanty's diagram about uh, uh, the little thin intersection between knowledge and ignorance, and that intersection happens to be uh, the place of Maya, as Professor Jane Mohanty uh, tells us. And therefore, philosophy in India remains in that place of Maya in that little stretch of interaction, intersection between knowledge and ignorance, between adhyasho and jnana, as Professor Mahanti has very beautifully explained. So large part of the uh, field of knowledge actually remains unaddressed by us. And one of the uh, very important theme at this point of time, without much ado and giving you much of, a, um, uh, much of an introduction, is this idea of life, you know. Uh, many people talk about life uh, in a very personal sense. Uh, in the sense of uh, uh, life turning into uh, this kind of an experiential lived uh, kind of a life, or a life which is unachieved and underrated, underexperienced. Uh, and therefore, life itself opens up uh, extremities of uh, a kind of a capture and also a kind of inability to grasp with what life brings in. So life remains caught in extremities and these extremities assume a certain kind of non-negotiability. One takes one of the extreme polarity of life and tries to understand that that from a certain polarity. And that polarity assumes the form of a subjective or intersubjective consciousness. And the other polarity remains completely outside it. Now, now this is something that is what we experience in terms of our understanding of life, that life leaves out a huge part for you to explore, you know. And life here literally is our biological life, uh, biological life which is supported by uh, the genetic process and the genetic process which is further augmented and supported by, oh, very nice, by a chemical process, you know. So, so you have this layered processes encoded within the notion of life. You know. Life is biological, life is genetic, and life is chemical. Now, out of these three layers, what probably is a theorization of life, you know, is an evolutionary understanding of life, how it moves from one layer to the other, how it moves from chemical to the genetic to the biological, and then further to the experiential, if you like. So there is a movement from one layer to the other. And as we move to a different layer, we actually forget what grounds that layer, whether the experiential layer is grounded in the biological, the biological is grounded in the chemical, or the chemical is grounded in the genetic, or genetic is grounded in the chemical. It's very interesting that genetic and chemical ground each other very explicitly in our understanding of sciences. While uh, it's not very clear that genetic grounds the experiential, or it's not very clear that experiential is grounded in the biological. So, so there is a kind of a transversality without being grounded, you know, that's something. It's a, it's a transversal between any of the two 
without grounding the other two or other many, many other aspects of life. So you, you create a kind of a narrow episteme. And that narrow episteme is not really answering the other aspects that are not transversely connected to the ground that you have chosen to explain life. You know. So now, what grounds do we choose to explain life is something very, very important. You know. I go straight away because something very fashionable in analytic philosophy is to talk about first personal point of view and the third personal point of view. Now, uh, Thomas Nagel, who took a third person point of view and called it objective, you know, typically objectivity doesn't exist anymore. You know, when I say that objectivity doesn't exist anymore, uh, I don't deny by force the existence of objects. But that which is called as object, whether that which has been named, called semantically, syntactically, pragmatically as an object, fits into a notion of object that one is trying to pursue. So there is this crisis, there is this undercurrent of a certain aporetic field in which the object does not fit into the object that one is supposed to study. All right? So that's something happened to objectivity. Let me give you a quick example. The idea of having numbers, you know. How are the numbers counted? You know, it's a big question. Are we going to count only real numbers? And if we are going to count real numbers, a system of real numbers cannot accommodate the system of imaginary numbers. And if we, go, if we are going to count system of imaginary numbers, the system of imaginary numbers hardly can accommodate tensors, you know, and fill tensors, you know, especially. Something like uh, a matrix, matrices that can be formed with tensors, you know, cannot be grounded uh, uh, in, in our understanding of counting, you know. So therefore, uh, there is, uh, without tensors, how do you map your objects? Objects that are falling due to gravity, objects that are being moved because of the uh, movement of electron, or objects that are moving through you and me, let's say neutrino particles, are they are filled in this home, in this room, and everybody's body is penetrated by the neutrinos. And we don't know how these neutrinos are coming from, where they are coming. Are they coming from a black body radiation? Are they coming from the black energy through which this universe is moving? Where are they coming from, all these neutrinos? So do we know these objects called neutrinos that fit into what we identify with our recognitional capacity, with our indexicals as objects. Do these objects fit into the notion of objects? Is a, is a very big question. Tom Nagel failed to answer that question. Of course, I don't. And if we look at the current situation of those who are propagating objectivity, let's say uh, uh, Stuart Kaufman, for example, a biologist, a system biologist, whose name comes to my mind, or uh, uh, Roger Penrose, for example, who got Nobel Prize, what kind of objects uh, Roger Penrose is talking about? Roger Pen Penrose, following Rai Choudhury's equation, you know, in astrophysics, where Rai Choudhury talked about the core and the superficial surface of a star, you know. And you have many superficial surfaces across a star. And these superficial surfaces are being pulled by the gravity towards its center. And yet they are pulled so much that a black hole can be created. Right, Rodhuri has distinctly established. And Roger Penrose accepted that kind of a position. Now, how do you oversee, or how do you not see, or how do you experimentally measure the gravitational force that pulls the super surfaces towards the core of a black hole, except some mathematical equations which are filled vectors and tensors and metric affine kind of mathematical formulations. You know. So you have these mathematical objects like neutrinos that are moving around and you are not able to accommodate them within your notion of objectivity. Now this I'm saying to dispel this notion of third person perspective. Can we also understand the lived experience of the other, the way the other experiences the world from a third person point of view? 
We can't experience that until and unless the other testifies that this is my experience, especially, let's say, you know, the, the loss, the kind of loss, the kind of lack, the kind of uh, distress that one experiences in a moment of grief, in a moment of uh, not being able to come to terms with certain experience itself. So the experience of experiencing happens in terms of loss, in terms of not being able to come to terms with itself, you know, with oneself or with the other, you know. And there is an experiential lack, lacuna, which cannot be filled up by a Advaita notion of plenitude, you know, for example, or by an Advaita notion of non-difference or indifference, you know, uh, which are supposed to be very powerful ontological notions as they are available in Shankara. Uh, so, so you have this gap between an experience and experiencing that experience. There's a gap between that. And experiencing an experience is necessarily a certain kind of a lack, a perpetual lack that keeps postponing itself in the form of one's desire to experience, in the form of one's desire to know. So the very desirability of the experience of experiencing, you know, is something that comes under a certain kind of questioning in your mind, one who is experiencing it. So, so the experiencer becomes the experienced, no doubt about it. But there is no continuity between the experiencer and the experienced. The experiencing self and the experienced self or non-self. I would call it, you know, it's neither self nor non-self. The, the experienced, the experience is neither self nor non-self. Well, Buddha is very, very correct, you know. Uh, but, but you have an experiencing self or an experiencer self, no doubt about it, but that experiencer self is also not something that is in terms of a heterophenomenology that you have embodiment and you are extended to the world and you have a certain directed intentionality and all those properties. The experiencer self actually lacks all those properties. It has to pick up those properties, you know, uh, from the world, as Gareth Evans would very rightly point, it up, point out. And it will depend on certain kind of bodily constitution. If I'm left-handed, my experiencing, my experiencer self is very different than if I am right-handed. And if I am a sabbasachi, you know, then my experiencer self is very different than if I am right-handed or if I am left-handed. And it, it's not possible to have a unified theory of self when you are, your self is left-handed or right-handed or you are amphibian, you know. You cannot have a unified notion of self. So experiencer self is a discrete entity. And I would take a Leibnizian point of view here that the experiencer self is indiscernible, you know. Like the dancer cannot be known from the dance. The moment you look at the dance, and if it is a quantum situation, you look at the top, the bottom is not there. Schrodinger's skate experiment, you don't know. You open the box, then you don't know whether the cat has undergone what kind of states the cat has undergone. If you close the box, then you know the cat has collapsed into something called a state of being dead. You know. so, so you don't know which state a particular experiencer self is having. And the experience of experiencing, you know, uh, and the knowledge of it, the desire to know about it, is a, is a certain kind of a gap or a loss or a perpetual kind of a lack. I think Laka, as a theorist, is very, very successful in, in telling us that our experience herself and the experience of experiencing you know, is a perpetual lack that can only give you an imaginary joso, but it's not real joso. The real strikes you at a different level, not at the level of the symbolic or the imaginary. And, and real is not out there to strike you necessarily, to awaken you to, uh, from your somnambulism or from your state of consciousness. So therefore, something is amiss here in the field of experience, and that cannot be filled up by objects, that cannot be filled up by subjects, that can 
cannot be filled up by, as Orindam Chakravarti tries to say, by interrelated, by interrelating subject and the object and intersubjectivity and their interoperability. As Orindam has taken a stance, and this stance seems to be very, very Anglo-Saxon, Anglo-American. It needs to be decolonized properly, which has, which he has refused to do in his last book that he has published from Bloomsbury. Uh, so, so you can see here that. That what is amiss in the field of experience, that's what constitutes the life. That's what takes us back to the ground, the chemical ground, the genetic ground that I was supposed to talk about, which first person perspective and the third person perspective both cannot capture. So then you ask this question, is there a second person perspective then? You know, that's where my talk begins. Now, a second person perspective, just in a very, very brief way, whatever is lacked by the first person and the second person pers perspective is supposedly, supposedly underlined, covered by a second person perspective. And a second person perspective is something like having this experience of grief, you know. It is like grieving for something. And grieving as an experience, grief as an experience, is very different than any other kind of experience. And, and it's not just any other sortal, the kind of sortals that you have in experience. Grief is not something like any other sortal. Grief is something where one creates a kind of autoimmunity in order to keep oneself close to the world. In grief, one is close to the world. And at the same time, one has lost the world, you know, in grief, let's say. And that's a substantial loss of what we otherwise socially cognize in friendship, in fraternity, in the presence of others that makes us happy or that makes us sad, or in encounters that makes us uh, feel the meaning of life in a certain way, or encounters that results into the loss of that sense of meaning. So, so second person experience is also somewhat dwindling. It's a dwindling mode of being if you like, you know. Uh, but at the same time, it's being with others. But when it is being with others, at the same time, it is mourning, it's grieving. It's something amiss there. As Derrida famously would say, that in the situation of grief, you know, as if one can see that one is dying, you know. Usually, we don't know when we die, and we have no knowledge of death. Just as Martha Nuzbuam would say, you know, she would say the other way around. She would say that you have the knowledge of the death of the other. Though you do not have knowledge of death of yourself, Derrida would say, well, death is a moment of grieving. It's a moment of mourning. And in a moment of grieving, in a moment of mourning, the object of grief goes amiss. Object of grief is not there. The very object, the very presence of the object of grief is not there. It's a kind of a present absence. Or you can call it even an absent present. Whichever way I would like to call it. It becomes an act of grieving. An act of grieving, that's part of the social cognition. That's part of what we call as that large part of life in which something has gone amiss. Because something has gone amiss, therefore you grieve. If something hasn't gone amiss, you won't be, uh, you won't be lamenting, you won't be mourning, you won't be grieving. Uh, and and much, much of our language arises from, uh, Derrida would say, that sense of grieving, that sense of mourning. And because it arises from the sense of mourning, therefore our language is not ours. Much of the language comes from the other. Now, now, you see, uh, following the same line of argument, I would say much of these epistemic claims that we are making is like an act of grieving. And if it is an act of grieving, something must go amiss in our epistemic claims. An epistemic claim can never be complete. Otherwise, we won't have so much of incompleteness. We won't have so much of inconsistency. 
You cannot have a consistent, complete epistemic framework. Why you can't have it? Because something has gone amiss there when you were trying to look at. And this is precisely reflected by a very famous experiment, you know, Elaine Aspect, one of the major quantum physicists, Elaine Aspect, who got Nobel Prize for his 1982 collapse experiment, you know. And the, uh, the summary of that experiment, I don't want to present the experiment in details, but the summary of the experiment is this. In the first very step of the experiment, you know, a photon particle which is fired through a, fired for a certain slit, you know. That photon particle gets, I mean, if you like, gets multiplied, pluralized into other photon particles. You can very easily understand from where these photon particles are coming. Well, if there is no observer, aspect would say, that one photon particle will be registered as that one photon particle. But if there is an observer, that photon particle would get pluralized, as if, aspect would say, as if that photon particle knows that you are observing that photon particle. You know. How does the photon particle know that you are observing the photon particle and its movement? Because you are not able to recognize its position, but you are trying to locate its movement without being able to recognize the position. And therefore, you are meeting a paradoxical situation of not knowing why so many photon particles have come from somewhere, because you are observing them. Now, now this is something very, very interesting kind of a paradox. And this is what also goes by uh, the knowledge paradox you know, of um, FIST. Fist's knowledge paradox, as we call it. The knowledge paradox is that, as Professor Dayakrishna jokingly used to say, that the area of non-knowledge, or the area of unknown, is always greater than the area of the known. And the area of unknown extends, more you try to know. You know, <laughs> that's Fitch's paradox. And that's Fitch's paradox arises from Alain Aspect's experiment as well. And if I take that experiment into something called quantum chronodynamics, which is a kind of a very interesting field of physics, and philosophers do deal with such a field at this point of time, quantum chromodynamics. And quantum chromodynamics happens in our brain, you know. Our brain is formed by microtubules, you know. Microtubules are inside the neuron. Neuron is a very large object. If we have to identify a neuron N somewhere in one region of the brain, uh, that region has many microtubules, billions of them. So Stuart Hameroff and Roger Penrose conducted these mathematical equations called orchestrated reduction, OR, orchestrated reduction. Orchestrated reduction happens in the form of collapsing the microtubule, the microtubule into a certain neuronal pathway where you can identify a string of neurons working or vibrating in a certain manner. I know. The moment you look at these vibrating neurons, you are able to identify the field potential of these vibrating neurons. With an fMRI, you can measure the field potential of the vibrating neurons. And these vibrating neurons with a certain field potential is awaiting I know, for other neurons to interfere. And there is an interference. You can see these neurons are getting broken into a variety of you know, gases, a variety of smoky regions. And these smoky regions between them have some kind of a indiscernible you know, bodies, bodies that are eukaryotic or prokaryotic in terms of carrying certain kinds of chemical fluids between them. And these smoky regions of neurons, which are produced by some kind of an interference by other neurons, what is this property? What is the property of those interfering neurons? This is the question that Stuart Hameroff and Roga Penrose have asked, you know. And uh, you know, our uh, philosophers like David Chalmers, especially David Chalmers, I would name him, who is interested to understand what is this smoky pattern 
Why is it that these neural networks are now breaking? So far we understood that, well, neural networks are Hoffman's net, and we have an input and the output. There's a kind of an analysis of uh, uh, neural networks, you know, NCCs, neural correlates, in order to give you a certain kind of a result, you know. Uh, but in case of mourning, for example, coming back to mourning, what kind of uh, neural correlates do you have in mourning? Well, our fMRI has identified certain parts of the brain, especially where the prefrontal cortex ends you know, and the midbrain begins. The, the cusp between the midbrain and the prefrontal cortex is the area where you have these complex emotions, such as grief, such as happiness, such as whatever, uh, the sense of lack and all this. And it is in that cusp, in that junction, that you have these neural smoky regions, which is filled with microtubules organized in a certain pattern. You can see certain patterns there, and these patterns are recognizable. Now, these patterns have properties of superposition, the moment you try to observe them with an fMRI and you try to draw an EEG of that, you can see that these patterns break into you know, a common discernible type of a pattern, as if the observer has broken them into a kind of a collapse. So Elaine Aspect's experiments are validated in our observations of brain processes through EEG and through fMRI, especially in the cusp between the prefrontal and the midbrain, where you have these complex emotions arising from there. So therefore, uh, you, can, you can see here uh, that a kind of a physical explanation is possible. But can the physical explanation that you give in terms of quantum states and their collapse and the observer dependence, you know. If we could have found a place where we can observe the brain from inside, can we observe the brain from inside? And that's the question that Hameroff and Penrose were chasing. And in the process, the device, this process of orchestrated reduction, that a certain neural mass can be reduced to a certain pathway and to a certain pattern. Whether these patterns and pathways actually correspond to a certain state that your brain is in, resulting into a certain kind of a response or a reaction or a certain kind of an output, you know. And what is the strict correlation between these two, uh, two, two situations? The pattern in the brain as observed, well, as observed is a collapsed pattern. It's not really a pattern which is emerging, but it's a collapsed pattern that you have observed following aspects experiment. Uh, that the brain also knows that the brain has been observed by an EEG or fMRI, and brain is responding to that observation in a certain way. Whether that kind of a conflation between the observer and the observed you know, actually gives us the correct picture of what is happening in the brain. That's the question that Hameroff and Penrose have chased. But they have no clear answer to that question. Uh, the only answer that is possibly possible in this kind of a situation in, is this, how these patterns are activated and how these patterns are deactivated. Whether these patterns are recursive patterns or whether they form a certain kind of a loop between them, as some of the theorists have mentioned, like Natika Newton and others. So, so what is happening in your brain? If your brain is embodied, if your self is embodied, and if your brain is operating in this kind of a chaotic manner, and it's not in a kind of a uh, systematic manner as you want it to be, it's a kind of a systematic chaos through which your brain is undergoing at every moment, then, then how do you theorize about the self and your experiencing? Isn't there something amiss? Isn't that the brain is grieving for a self? Brain is grieving for a conceptual semantic. Is that, is that possible through your brain? Or you have to take recourse to an external device that will help the brain in understanding the situation in a manner that Either a computer has intervened in the situation or some other people have intervened, some other human brains have intervened into the situation. So there is always an intervention towards which the brain is open. And brain is not closed on to the process and the procedure that goes into it. So therefore, you have a situation which is not homeostatic at all. 
you have a situation where your brain is morphed onto a situation. You have a situation where brain is, your brain is morphed by someone else. And uh, there is an evolutionary process of mirror neurons. Our mirror neurons, at this moment, you all are mimicking me, whatever I am saying. And I'm also trying to mimic all of you, what you all are thinking. So the mirror neurons are working at a certain level, but mirror neurons are not all, they are just available in the prefrontal cortex, about whose activity we are able to know, slight monkeying that is possible by all of us, that we can always perform. And that's where the performance of the brain arises it. But, but performance of the brain is not all. The non-performative part of the brain, which is at the back here, which is like a workshop where you take your brain and the certain states of the brain are corrected you know, in a certain way in order to respond to the interference and intervention that are coming from the other brain. You know. so, so where are we led to this kind of a situation? There is no uh, mathematical answer to, to that situation except talking about how complex type of proteins are created I'll just give you an example of a complex protein, and then I'll uh, stop this discussion. Uh, some of the proteins are called chaperones, you know, chaperones. And this chaperones protein allow other proteins to correctly fold. Proteins cannot fold by themselves unless they're assisted by this chaperones protein. And one of the chaperones protein is called tau protein which is responsible. Tau protein forming filaments and forming certain clusters is responsible for Alzheimer's, which is a major you know, problem at this point of time. A large number of people are having assemblies of tau protein. Tau proteins that are obstructing, you know, folding of the proteins. And you are left with a lot of unfolded proteins at this point of time in your brain. So your brain processes are not supported by a systematic understanding of proteomics. And if it is not uh, supported by a systematic understanding of proteomics, how do you connect these proteins with the genomic constitution that you have? As I was trying to say, the chemical and the genetic mutually interfere and mutually uh, reinforce each other. Uh, either they are close to each other or they are open to each other. And sometimes they are closed and open simultaneously to each other. Uh, but, but then how this process will go on in the case of tau protein is a, is a big question. And there is no answer to the question, except saying that we can only notice a complex pattern but we don't know these complex patterns are sustainable or not sustainable. Now, how is our consciousness then formed? Are we able to enact all that that is happening and we leave it out, we say we are not aware of it, but we are aware of our hand and leg. How are we aware of our hand and leg? How do I know that my hand is my hand? Except presupposing at a pre-reflective level, at a pre-attentional level that, well, this is my hand. But my hand has undergone all kinds of changes, so it's no longer my hand, as Shaun Galaghar points out, you know, very recently, a book that he has written, Self and Its Disorder. The book is out just last week. He points out your hand is not your hand. So your brain is not your hand. No, your brain is not in your hand, or your hand is not in your brain. So, so what happens to you, the very idea of me and myself, that first person perspective at Bokits, there is no mindness at Dan Jahabi would like to say. Where is that mindness except in Dan Jahabi's mind? Dan Jahabi's guru supervisor, Saun Galagar, is now refuting what all that Dan Jahabi has built up. So therefore, you do not really have a first person perspective. Similarly, you don't have a third person perspective. So you are only left with an implied perspective, a perspective by implication which is implied by the others, which is implied by other brains. It's an implied social perspective. Social because it's implied by the other and not by you. And this implication, you know, takes you much towards a longer temporal journey. Your sense of time, you know, and someone else's sense of time may not be synchronized at all. You know, it's not possible to play a synchronic game like cricket or football anymore, but a totally asynchronous, asynchronous game, such as chess probably, is one of the most asynchronous game, asking you to redraw the ideas of intelligibility, the ways in which brain is computing a certain move, and therefore it's becoming more and more 
temporally disjointed, asynchronous kind of a situation in which we are trying to make a move. And uh, that move cannot be called as my move or your move, but it is certainly interfered by the other people and other moves. And it's implied as a move. It's not even a move that is taken consciously by me. That doesn't mean that we do not have consciousness. But we have lost a part of our consciousness. And that loss is very, very important. It's not a loss of cognition, but it's certainly a loss of our assumed point of view of a first person or a third person perspective. And that's where second person phenomenology needs to be developed more and more. Uh, I think I stop here and we can talk. This is like a general contour of the whole discussion. Any specific question, I'll be able to answer and probably try to uh, give an answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Biswas. Uh, Professor Biswas is uh, one of the very rare uh, academic in the country who traverses comfortably uh, across traditions. Always, and this is a feature which I have known uh, about him uh, from his early uh, research days. Uh, so uh, I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions sure. because I think we all are victim of uh, this either first person or the third person uh, perspective. Uh, so your, the talk is open for discussion and comments. <laughs>